Hi everyone! Are you as excited as I am to swatch out these dots together? Woohoo! Okay, so this will be a long one, so I suggest watching this two times the speed or, you know, grab some snacks and enjoy! <laughs> so I bought this dot card from Jackson's when they had their Schmincke sale back in April or May, I think? It came very well packed and I particularly love this translucent sheet of plastic they put in between these pages. It's very thick and sturdy for its purpose. Just listen to it. Overall, the dots seem rather tiny, but I'd say they gave about as much as Windsor & Newton's dot card as well as Shinhan PWC's dot card. Most of these seem substantial, but this one dot here, I feel like maybe they could have went back in and gave me more. But oh well. The dot card itself doesn't contain pigment info, so I also opted to order this Schmincke color chart booklet because it includes all the pigment info and lots more information. I also got this from Jackson's and I'll leave a link below in the description box should you be interested. So my filming slash painting area is rather small, so to make things more manageable, I decided to cut this in half. The brush I'll be using to swatch today is just a very cheap, tiny synthetic brush by Renaissance. The more sturdy bristles assist in scrubbing out paint more easily. If you were to use a natural animal hair brush, the scrubbing motion may damage the hairs of the brush. So that's why I always use a cheap synthetic brush to swatch out dot cards. Before we start, I just wanted to quickly say that for the most part, these dots re-wet very well and quite easily. There will be some dots that are harder to re-wet or re-wet noticeably easier, and I'll let you know which ones those are as we go along. Alright, let's get on with the swatching. First up, we have Titanium Opaque White PW6, which is clearly much more opaque than the one next to it. I drew on the black lines using this Sakura Pigma Graphic 3 marker. It seems like some of the black line washed off, so there's a bit of gray at the right of the swatch there. Sorry about that. As for this permanent Chinese white PW4, I'm actually not too mad about this one because it's semi-transparent, but that white film of paint is so even that I could hardly tell it's there. Next is Titanium Yellow PY53. This one is quite powdery and very cool in temperature. It would be very nice for a pastel yellow. Schmincke actually offers another color also made with PY53 called Rutal Yellow, which I'll talk more about when we get to that one. This one here is Lemon Yellow made with PY3, or sometimes known as Hansa Yellow Light. Despite not being rated as light fast as some other yellow pigments, I actually like to use PY3 if I ever need a lemon yellow that is transparent. This Cadmium Yellow Lemon made with PY35 is very similar to the previous one, just more opaque. It's still not as bright as Rembrandt's Cadmium Lemon, which is by far my favorite lemon yellow despite its opacity. Next, we have Chromium Yellow Hue Lemon PY175, aka Benzimidazolone Lemon. This one is slightly warmer than the previous two. Then we have Vanadium Yellow, made with PY184, which is your bismuth vanadate or bismuth yellow. It's the same hue as the previous PY175, but I'm a little surprised this one is like semi-opaque. Next is Cadmium Yellow Light PY35. I'd say this one is where we start getting into our middle yellows. It's definitely on the warmer end of the lemon yellow section but could also pass for a cool middle yellow if that's what you're after. The next two are pretty similar and I would consider both of them middle yellows. This pure yellow one here is made with PY154 and the one next to it is Aurelin Hue made with PY151. Chemically, both of these are benzimidazolones and despite the different transparency symbols, I'd say they're both similarly transparent. The only reason I'd choose one over the other is that the pure yellow is series 2 and is cheaper than Aurelin Hue, which is series 3. 
Moving on, we have cadmium yellow medium PY35. This one is noticeably warmer than the previous ones, so I'd say we're getting into the territory of warm yellows. However, depending on what colors you have in your palette, this one and the next one could still pass off as middle yellows. Chromium yellow hue light, this is our first double pigments color made with PY153 and PY155. I was interested in what this one is supposed to emulate and why. A quick search led me to the Wikipedia page that stated chrome yellow in paints was made with a substance that included lead. Lead is a toxic heavy metal so it makes sense. Next, transparent yellow PY150, also known as nickel azo yellow, super transparent and has a beautiful glow. I'm not much of a yellow person but this one is one that I must have in my palette. Next we have Turner's Yellow made with PY216. This one is semi-opaque and although it may seem a bit powdery, I wouldn't recommend this for those looking for pastel colors. This one is definitely more vibrant than pastels. A viewer has told me in the past that they have tried many PY216s and it's rather consistent throughout various brands. If you'd like to try this pigment and hue, I'd like to know that White Knights calls theirs Naples Yellow Light. They do have a Naples Orange also made with PY216, but that one is much more orange and not comparable. Next we have Quinacridone Gold Hue made with PY150 and PR101, the same pigments used in White Knights Indian Gold. Personally, I like my Quin Gold Hues to wash down to a yellow, but this one seems to wash to an orange, so not for me. Then we have Chromium Yellow Hue Deep, PY65, Cadmium Yellow Deep, PY35 and PO20, and Indian Yellow, PY110, PY154. I would consider all three of these warm yellows or orange-leaning yellows. Performance-wise, they're all the same to me, but if I had to choose one from these three, I would pick Chromium Yellow Hue Deep because it's made with a single pigment and also cheaper being a Series 2. This yellow-orange made with PY110 definitely marks the start of the oranges. I've never used PY110 before, but this dot seemed a little difficult to re-wet. I'm not sure if it's because of the pigment itself, or maybe it would have been easier to re-wet if it had more mass to it. Next is Cadmium Orange Light, made with PO20. I'm not a fan of oranges, but this one is pretty vibrant, so it's definitely piqued my interest. Next, Chromium Orange Hue, made with PO62. Like the Chromium Yellow Hue, true Chromium Orange contains lead, so this PO62, which is a benzimidazolone, is much safer. Cadmium Orange Deep, made with PO20. This one and the previous Cadmium Orange Light both re-wet extremely easily. Then we have Transparent Orange, made with PO71. I think this is my first time to try this pigment, and I must say, it's a lot more orange than I expected. I thought it would lean more red. Anyway, this Saturn Red is made with PO64. If I were to buy an orange from Schmincke, I think I'd get this one because it seems to be the cheapest so far, being a Series 1. And now, beginning the fiery warm reds. We have Cadmium Red Orange made with PO20. I think this is our third single pigment PO20, so do be aware which shade of PO20 you want to buy. Then we have Permanent Red Orange and Permanent Red, both made with PO62 and PR242. Cadmium Red Light made with PR108, and this one was visibly more opaque, but that's typical for cadmiums. Next we have here Geranium Red made with PR242, which is very similar to the one next to it, Vermilion made with PR255. I'm actually quite partial to PR242 because I had been using Sennelier's PR242 long before I knew what pigments were, so it was a surprise to me when I found out PR255 was more popular. Then we have Vermilion Light made with PR188. I can't tell if this one is hard to re-wet or if it's not very pigmented. I don't think I've tried this pigment before, so I don't know why that is. 
and now Scarlet Red PR254, which many of you might know as Pyrrhal Red. This one felt so luscious when I was watching it. I can definitely see how some people might describe Schminke as buttery. And another PR108, this one is called Cadmium Red Medium and is rather mm, this deep, dark, opaque middle red. Quinacridone Red Light, however, is extremely transparent in contrast. This one is made with PR207. Don't mistake this for PR209 that is also sometimes called Quin Red, but thankfully not in this watercolor range. It's also a little difficult to re-wet. Then we have Transparent Red Deep made with PR144. Oh, it's a Series 1. That's nice. And this Cadmium Red Deep made with PR108 almost looks brown. Like this Perylene Maroon made with PR179. I do have a mixing video on PR179 if you're interested. Do check that out. Link will be below. Perylene Dark Red made with PR178 is actually more vibrant than I expected. It's very similar to Scarlet Red on top of it, but it's a tiny bit darker. Here's the world-renowned Fugitive Alizarin Crimson made with PR83 colon 1. This one looks like a Quin Rose, but just a darker Quin Rose if you know what I mean. Ruby Red Deep made with PR264. This one is one that I see people use quite a lot, but I don't have it. I'm not really sure why I don't, but this one really makes me want to experiment with it some more. Then we have Matter Lake Deep, made with PR83 colon 1 and PR177. This one doesn't seem to be very light fast, and it was a bit hard to re-wet. Then here's Matter Red Dark, PV19 and PR179. It's pretty much similar to the previous one, but more muted. Next is Bordeaux, made with PR187. I actually swatched this all out without knowing the pigments, so I could really appreciate the colors as they are. And this one threw me off, because I was expecting a color like Daniel Smith's Bordeaux made with PV32. So just letting you know here that they are not the same despite having the same name. Rose Matter PR83 colon 1 and PR48 colon 4. This one is low tinting, which is typical for Rose Matters. I'd say it's pretty easy to re-wet as I'm able to get it as dark as it could go within the first few scrubs. These next two are both made with PV19. This first one here is Permanent Carmine and it's definitely semi-opaque. And this one here is Ruby Red and is a beautiful, transparent, cool red. If you're looking to get a quinacridone rose from Schminke, this one is the one I suggest you go with. It does lean more red on the PV19 spectrum, and personally, I much prefer warmer PV19s anyways, so this one's great. Next, we have Magenta. This one is made with PV42, and I believe only Schminke and Daniel Smith offer this pigment. I've actually had this pigment on my to-buy list for a long time, but I think I'll give it a pass since any other quinacridone rose could easily replace this for me. There isn't really anything special about it, in my opinion at least. And now we have Purple Magenta made with PR122. This is typically known as Quinacridone Magenta and is one of my all-time favorite pigments. I did film a PR122 comparison video and found that the various brands I have, PR122 is pretty consistent throughout. This Schminke one is no different, solid performance. This one is called Quinacridone Magenta, made with PR202. Seems to be the same hue as the previous, but slightly more muted. And now we have Quinacridone Violet, made with PV19, which is your typical PV19 beta that is more blue-leaning as opposed to the PV19 alpha. I absolutely love Schminke's Potter's Pink, made with PR233. I have this one and really enjoy using it because the granulation is very apparent and shows through in mixes as well. Moving on, Perylene Violet PV29. I'm not sure why Schminke labels this as opaque. Perylenes are generally pretty transparent. This one I'd say is also transparent as well. The worst it could be labeled as would be semi-transparent. Quinacridone Purple PV55. This one looks a lot like the blue version of PV55 in the Van Gogh range. 
Next is manganese violet PV16. I also really like this one a lot because when mixed with lighter, cooler blues, the red violet granulation shows up and it's so magical. Schmincke Violet is made with PV23, your typical dioxazine violet. Next, we have Cobalt Violet Hue, made with PV62. For a low tinting cobalt violet color, it rewets very well and granulates beautifully. I have a video comparing this to Lucas's Cobalt Violet, also made with PV62. Again, I'll leave the link below. And here we have what they call Ultramarine Violet, made with PV15 and PB29. Typical ultramarine violets are a single pigment PV15, so I found it quite interesting Schmincke offers this like this. It actually reminds me of Winsor & Newton's Smalt Blue, made with a single pigment PV15. So I'm wondering if maybe Schmincke was trying to imitate that color with this one. Deft Blue is made with PB60, typical indenthrone blue, nice and pigmented, super easy to re-wet as well. Indigo made with PB15 colon 1 and PB66. I don't generally use indigo, so it's a bit difficult for me to compare this to others for you. To be honest, whenever I swatch out indigos, sometimes I think they're really dark and that they could pass for Payne's Gray. Anyway, what interested me about this color is that they use the fugitive PB66, which is also used for Shinhan's PWC's indigo. And now we have dark blue, which is, oh, it's also made with PB60 and dendrone blue. Deft blue is noticeably warmer in hue though. And upon comparing with my swatches, this dark blue is the same shade as Daniel Smith's PB60. Next row, Thalo Sapphire Blue made with PB15 colon 4. This seems to be more of a red shade like typical Thalo Blue red shades made with PB15 colon 6. Cobalt Blue Deep, PB74. As you can see, I'm having trouble re-wetting this color. I'm not sure if it's Schmincke's formula or the nature of this pigment, but I much prefer Winsor & Newton's PB74 as theirs was much easier to re-wet. The next two are both made with PB29. The first one is French Ultramarine. It's much warmer and has strong granulation, whereas the one next to it, Ultramarine Finest, is a bit cooler and does not granulate. Personally, I prefer my Ultramarine Blues to lean red, so I do prefer the French Ultramarine, but the Ultramarine Finest is also very useful in pieces of art where granulation is unwanted. Next, we have Ultramarine Blue, but this one contains both PB29 and PB15. The hue doesn't look different from the previous one, but this one does granulate a little bit. Cobalt Blue Light. This one is your typical cobalt blue made with PB28. It seems to granulate a bit, but not a whole lot. I'm actually looking for a cobalt blue that has medium to strong granulation. If anyone has any brand suggestions, please let me know down below. Last row of this page, Cobalt Blue Hue made with PW4 and PB29. So that's a white pigment and ultramarine blue. This reminds me a lot of student grade cobalt blues where they don't actually use the cobalt pigment. Next, Mountain Blue made with PW5, PB29, and PG7. This one felt a lot like White Knight's Cerulean Blue but more muted. And then we have Cobalt Azure PB35. If you're looking for a Cerulean Blue in the Schmincke Hordam range, this one is the one for you. I'm not very impressed though, since it doesn't seem to re-wet very well. Next is Prussian Blue PB27. 
I'm also quite disappointed with this one. I need to scrub so much. Normally, the Prussian blues I've tried in the past have all been easy to re-wet and high tinting. This one is a bit of a letdown. Paris Blue. This one is triple pigmented with PB15, PB15 colon 1, and PB27. I'm so confused. What is even the purpose of this color? It's so similar to the one surrounding it. Is it really necessary? And then we have Thalo Blue PB15 colon 1, which is very middle of the road. It's neither red shade nor green shade. On to the second page, we have Cerulean Blue Hue made with Thalo Blue Green Shade PB15 colon 3 and PW4. I'm actually very surprised with this one as most Cerulean Blue Hues tend to be lighter in value, but this one still feels very much like a transparent Thalo Blue, being just a tad bit more opaque. Next, we have Helio Cerulean made with PB15 colon 3, and that's just your typical phthalo blue green shade. And then we have Cobalt Cerulean made with PB36. I quite like this one because it's a more vibrant PB36 for a cerulean blue. Helio Turquoise PB16, your typical Thalo Turquoise. As some of you might know, this is my hands down favorite pigment, but it doesn't seem to be able to get as dark in mass tone as my regular Holbein one. Although it might just be because I have a small dot to work with here. And then we have Cobalt Turquoise PG50 and Cobalt Green Turquoise PB36. I absolutely love these two. If you have these two colors in other brands and want to try Schminke, it definitely doesn't disappoint. For those who have never tried either of these colors, I can really recommend them because they're not drastically different from other brands, and the hues, opacity, and granulation are all typical for these two colors. Then we have Prussian Green made with PG7 and PB60. So that's Thalo Green and Indenthrone Blue. I actually quite like this one because on its own, it almost seems like a darker Thalo Turquoise type of color. Then we have Viridian PG18. This pigment is typical to be low tinting and hard to re-wet, but this one re-wets rather easily, and the tinting strength seems to be on the higher end compared to other brands. Chromium Oxide Green Brilliant PG7 and PG18. I think this one would be great for those who want a Viridian that has a bit higher tinting strength. Next, Thalo Green PG7. This is our typical Thalo Green Blue shade. And the one next to it called Helio Green PG36. This one, again, is your typical thalo green yellow shade. Last in this row, Permanent Green Olive PO62 and PG7. This one reminds me a lot of Hooker's Green in many brands. Alright, these three are so funny to me. So we have Sap Green, Permanent Green, and May Green. All of them contain PG7, but the yellow component is different for each, being PY153, PY155, and PY151 respectively. I just personally find it funny because I use Rembrandt quite a bit, and their range of convenience greens also contains PG7, but the yellow they use is either PY154 or PY150. Nowhere near as many different pigments as we'll see in a bit with the other convenience greens in this range. Cobalt Green Pure PG19. 
This actually reminds me a lot of Roman Schmal's Cobalt Green Light, which seems to be the same color, have the same opacity and granulation, except Roman Schmal's is made with PG50. This one is Cobalt Green Dark PG26. I really like Schmincke's version of this pigment due to its dark mass tone. I also have a PG26 comparison video, link is in the description. Next, Hooker's Green. This one contains three pigments, PB15,3, PG7, and PY42. I quite like mixing my own greens, but this one is a pretty nice middle-ish green. Olive Green, PB15, and PG8. I wonder why they chose to use the Fugitive PG8. Surely there must be other light fast pigments they can use to make Olive Green. Okay, next is Chromium Oxide Green, PG17. This one is extremely easy to re-wet and granulates beautifully. Next, we have Olive Green Yellowish, P062 and PG7. This is actually the type of hue I think of when I think of Olive Green. The previous Olive Green felt a bit too blue. Green Earth is a bit difficult to re-wet, so I'll come back to that. Transparent Green Gold, PY154 and PBR7. This one is rather difficult to re-wet. I don't enjoy it at all. I feel like it might just be trying to mimic PY129. Back to Green Earth, PBR7 and PG7. Again, I wonder why they felt the need to add PG7 when they could have easily made this with a single pigment color. If you'd like this color, but with a single pigment PBR7, check out Shinhan PWC Terra Verte Yellow Shade. That said, it's very similar to my Roman Small Green Earth made with PG23. Finally, we're at Rutal Yellow made with PY53, same as Titanium Yellow we swatched earlier in the beginning of the video. This one, however, is much warmer and I feel like would be more versatile as it's the more natural one of the two. Check out my mixing video of this exact color if you'd like to see more. Next row, we have Jean Brilliant Dark and Naples Yellow for the first two colors. Both contain the same pigments, PW6, PY53, and PBR24. Jean Brilliant is actually often used for portraits or nude paintings. It's a bit difficult to tell, but I think they're both the same hue, except Naples Yellow seems darker. Don't you think so? Next up, Raw Sienna made with PBR7 and PY43. I can't quite decide whether this one is hard to re-wet or just low tinting. Reminds me a lot of Rembrandt's low tinting Raw Sienna. Next, Yellow Raw Ochre, PY42 and PY43. This is where it suddenly occurred to me that we're getting into the earth colors now, and generally earth colors tend to be more difficult to re-wet, no matter what brand you use. So I'll be putting a drop of water on each dot from here on out so we can hopefully get rid of the factor that they're all difficult to re-wet. This one is Titanium Gold Ochre made with PBR24. This one is very opaque and I'd say quite vibrant for a yellow earth. Then we have yellow ochre made with a single pigment PY42. The hue of this one is typical of yellow ochres. It seems to be semi-opaque, but it dries more like a semi-transparent. And here we have transparent ochre PY42. Judging from the way it has dried on here, the hue, and rewettability, I'm quite certain this is your typical transparent yellow oxide. It's not a strong tinting color at all, but it is a more muted yellow earth alternative. Roman Small and Rembrandt's transparent yellow oxides are similar to this one. Next, Raw Umber, PBR7, and PY42. I absolutely love this type of raw umber. If you loved Rembrandt's discontinued raw umber, I definitely suggest checking out this one. It's practically the same. And now we have Naples Yellow Reddish. 
four pigments in this one, PW6, PW4, PR242, and PY42. Wait, what? Why did they decide to use two white pigments? That's weird. Well, either way, I'm happy enough with Van Gogh's Naples yellow redder, so I probably won't be getting this one. Moving on, not sure how to pronounce this one. Spinel brown? Spinel brown? I think I'll go with spinel brown. Made with PY119. This one is very similar to Roman Schmalz Aquarius Brown made with PBR11, but this one is more red while the Aquarius Brown leans more orange. Gold Brown, PY65 and PBR41. Oh wow, I've never come across PBR41 before. Anyway, this color does seem rather high tinting, just like the one next to it, Transparent Sienna, PR101. This is just your typical transparent red oxide. Nice and smooth, no granulation. Maroon brown made with a single pigment PBR7. It granulates beautifully. Look at that, it's so gorgeous. I think if I were to pick a brown for a burnt sienna in my palette, I would definitely pick this one and not this burnt sienna that is made with PR101 and PBK9. This one does not granulate, but it does lean more red than the maroon brown. English Venetian Red PR101 This was such a joy to swatch, buttery smooth, but also very opaque. And this one is Matter Brown PR206, also known as Quinacridone Burnt Scarlet. I'd categorize this as more of a red than a brown. That said, it does pique my interest. Transparent Brown made with PBR41. Oh, this was the one in Gold Brown earlier. Wow, this one is very vivid. It actually reminds me of PBR25. And then we have Mahogany Brown, PBR33. I absolutely love this one. If I'm only allowed to have one earth color in my palette, I'd choose this Mahogany Brown because it's a good midway between Burnt Sienna and Burnt Umber. There's also like a two-tone granulation going on. And now we have Indian Red made with PR101 and PR206. This one is very nice. That granulation is gorgeous. It's definitely one of the more violety Indian Reds. I also find it interesting that the German name is Kaput Mortem. Mars Brown made with PBR6. I actually have White Knight's Mars Brown made with the same pigment. This Schminke one though is much easier to re-wet and much more pigmented. I definitely want to get this one in the future. Now we have Transparent Umber PR101. This looks to be Schminke's version of a transparent brown oxide. It doesn't seem to granulate at all and Schminke does not label it as such either. I'm inclined to prefer Daniel Smith's one over this one. Burnt Umber PBR7. Absolutely luscious! I absolutely love this one. Very chocolatey as well, like it's smooth like butter. I'm not sure how I feel about it not granulating, but I still like it a lot. Green Umber PBR7. I believe this type of umber isn't very popular, but brands still offer it anyway. Rembrandt has the same color but made with PBR8. I find that if you mix a green umber like this one with a raw sienna, then you can get a raw umber. Fascinating, right? Okay, here we have Van Dyke Brown made with three pigments, PY150, PBR7, and PBK7. It's definitely very dark and high tinting, which is very different from the natural Van Dyke pigment, NBR8.
Next, we have sepia brown made with PB15, colon 1, PBR7, and PBK9. I personally don't really use these types of dark colors, so I wanted to ask if anyone uses sepia a lot and has any specific sepia recommendations for me. Sepia? Sepia? Not sure how you say that either. This one is sepia brown reddish. PR242, PBR7, and PBK9. It seems to be easier to re-wet than the previous. And now for neutral tint made with PR122, PB60, and PBK7. For a black color, it clearly has a pinkish undertone. Neutral gray, PR255, PB60, and PO62. This one definitely looks blue since the one we just swatched is clearly more red. Payne's Gray Bluish PBK6 and PB15 colon 6. This is very surprising to me. Payne's Gray colors usually lean a bit blue already, but this seems like the phthalo blue in this mix is overpowering the black. Paraline Green, PBK31. Wow, just wow. Schminke does not disappoint. I love how deep and dark it can get. Such a lovely moody color. And now we have Schminke Paints Gray, PR101, PB29, and PBK7. Is it just me or does this one look like a rather neutral black? Lamp Black PBK6. I normally mix my own blacks using phthalo green and a red, but this one might be good as a convenience type of thing. Moving on to Ivory Black PBK9. Nothing too special here, just a black with a bluish undertone. Hematite Black PG17. I absolutely love this one. Definitely my fave dark color so far. It paints like a gray, like a dark smoky gray, but it dries like a black and it granulates. Next, Anthracite PBK7. This one would be your typical lamp black. Graphite gray made with PBK10, which is just graphite basically. And then we have Mars Black PBK11. I have this one in a couple brands and love the granulation. This one also performs very well. Alright, these are the pearlescent ones. I thought it would show up better on black, so I added a black line. I'll skip these for now and we'll come back to them afterwards to let the black line dry completely. And now we have the fluorescent colors. Brilliant Upper Rose and Brilliant Purple are both made with PR122 and a fluorescent pigment. Schminke's Upper Rose here isn't so bad, but the brightest one I've tried is by Magello. Then we have Brilliant Red Violet made with PV55 and a fluorescent pigment. It seems to be exactly like a regular PV55, but remains vibrant when dry. Last of the fluorescence, Brilliant Blue Violet made with PB29 and PV23. Last but not least, we have Silver and Gold, both made with pearlescent pigments. As expected, they do show up better on darker backgrounds. And there we have it! That's the whole range of regular Schmincke Horodam watercolors. Some of my favorite are Cobalt Violet Hue, Potter's Pink, 
cobalt green turquoise, rutile yellow, and mahogany brown. And ones that I'm inclined to buy and try in the future are magenta, helio turquoise, spinel brown, mars brown, and hematite black. Overall, I feel like this range of watercolors is pretty solid. There are a few unique pigments, nothing too special, but I think Schmincke is distinct in its consistent formula and ease of rewettability. It's been a really long video today, but I hope you enjoyed the close-up swatches. If you find my videos useful, please consider becoming a member of this channel by clicking the join button to see more. It is a subscription, but you can cancel any time. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching everyone. Don't forget to drink lots of water and stay hydrated.